Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Autism Hour Summit of April 2022 with Play Street. My name is Sarah Elsa Abraham, and I am a speech language pathologist working in Play Street. Play Street is an organization that provides educational services to help the child with special needs become independent and live up to their potential. We offer power, parent empowerment programs and integrated schooling programs and a variety of clinical services. As April is Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, we wanted to bring to you the pioneers in the field of autism to guide us all and spread more awareness and knowledge. And we have almost reached the end of our summit. And today's talk is going to be about exploring AACs or alternative and augmentative communication and how to make it an effective program to build a child's communication and language. So today with us, we have the lovely Shireen Idikula to, under, to help us understand this a lot better. Shireen Susan Idikula is a passionate and lively speech and language therapist. She is a level four advanced OPT therapist and currently the only one in India at this level. She's also a feeding therapist and a movement therapist. She is the co-creator of the Play Talk program, which is an AAC program to build communication and language. She has created various programs called Learning with Rhythm and Movement and Whole Body to Speech program. Shereen conducts online and offline parent empowerment programs and mentors professionals and organizations across India. She's also the Director of Clinical Services at Play Street Specially Able Educare Trust, Bangalore, India. So we want to welcome you, Shereen, to our Autism Hour Summit. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It is an honor to have you with us. Would you like to say a few words to our viewers before we get started? Why not? I'm hoping that all the viewers, all the audience that we've had have been really able to gain a lot of knowledge from the other speakers. We had an amazing line of speakers. And um, I, I know I gained a lot of knowledge from them and I'm hoping the audience has been able to gain that knowledge too and really be able to widen their perspectives a lot more and not just from uh, the therapist's point of view or a doctor's point of view, but also the children's point of view uh, where we had Mikey and uh, Tatwit come in and share what's happening with them. And I think that those voices were really important um, too as part of our summit. So I'm hoping everyone's enjoying it and it's always there for, you know, for those who didn't know about our summit to come and watch later also. Uh, but our goal is to just spread, spread that knowledge around. Spread that knowledge, yes. Beautiful, yes. So let's jump right into today's conversation and get, so I think that it's something very important that we're going to talk about that a lot of people, a lot of professionals and parents as well have a lot to ask. And uh, let's start right at the beginning. So we want to talk about AACs. So could you explain to us uh, what is an AAC and how does it actually differ from speech? So let's look at it the other way in terms of what is speech. Okay. Speech, as you all know, is is the what we use, right, to communicate. Right now, all of us are using. Speech is a motor act. Okay, It needs coordinated, timed, and sequenced muscle movements to happen in the mouth, which, if used appropriately, can help us communicate thoughts, ideas, feelings. Right, But when speech is affected, and it could be for a variety of reasons, it could be a delay in the development, it could be traumatic brain injury, it could be motor planning difficulties, it could be a variety of reasons that speech could be affected. That's when AAC comes in to save the day. AAC, like Sarah, you just mentioned, is alternative and augmentative communication, meaning it could be an alternative to speech, or it could be something that we add on to speech to make the communication more effective. And it uses different communication devices, strategies, systems, tools, anything that will replace and support natural speech. All of that together is what we call as AAC. And you have different forms of AAC. So all of these are basically to support anyone struggling with communicating using speech. And the power of AAC is that it gives a person with limited speech, more words, more language, and it makes it possible for them to communicate far more than they can with speech alone. 
So you're basically not limiting it to one modality and you're widening it for the person so that they don't get frustrated if that one modality is difficult for them. Yes, definitely. That's very true how it's helping, you know, individuals to communicate much further that they don't have to solely depend on their speech alone. And I think that's something that a lot of parents also need to understand that there is more to it. So just jumping in. So could you explain this a little more further? What exactly are the different types of AACs and where do we begin? When do we begin using this with our children? So there are, again, um, you have something called aided systems and unaided systems. So when you say unaided AAC system, it means that anything that does not use additional equipment, and that could be your gestures, your facial expressions, vocalization, speech, and sign language, whichever sign language in whichever country that you're using, whether it's American, British, Indian sign language, sign language, right? So that's unaided communication. Aided communication is anything that uses equipment. And this can range from low-tech to high-tech methods of using pictures, symbols, um, high-tech devices, apps, etc. So it could be communication boards that are printed on paper. It could be the picture exchange communication system, for example, PEX, right? Or it could be writing. Yeah. That's also another uh, form of low-tech aided communication systems. Alphabet yeah. or letter boards that are used. Um, or it could be software or devices like PlayTalk that okay. we use and we have developed to enable um, the communication further. Okay. So when would you say, ma'am, like these are like the different types that we use. Or, so mm -hmm. how would you choose what is appropriate or when do you choose to begin using an AAC with a child? So the, the reason I think AAC is delayed because there's so many myths around AAC, right? Yeah. And one of them, to answer your question specifically, is when do we begin? So there's a myth that young children are not ready for AAC and will not yeah. require AAC until they reach school age. And okay. that is a big myth because there's sure. a lot of research. And again, this is based on pure research that's been mm. done in uh, 2010, 2014, 2015, Many, a lot, there's a lot of research out there that says that early implementation of AAC can, mm. a, can help in the development of natural speech and language and okay. can also increase the vocabulary for children for ages three and younger. Mm. So okay. If you're looking at, no, I'm only going to introduce it when they get into school, my, it's late. You can do it much earlier because, earlier. again, because of the neuroplasticity of the brain, the child picks up on more because you're not limiting it to one modality again and, you know, encouraging so, more that they are able to pick up on the speech and language skills a lot better. Right. And um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of research and I would encourage parents before they decide on no, I don't want to use AAC or any other myths that come in there, which, you know, we can discuss later is really just look it up. Just look it up. If you just look mm. at what are the myths surrounding AAC and does AAC stop uh, a lot of things from developing, you will see that research has found that it does not. So we can start with really young children um, and the kind of AAC you use, of course, would differ uh, with respect to, um, the situation, the environment the family is in, uh, whether you need to go low tech versus high tech. Um, the, again, there's research based on both what happens when you use low tech versus whenever you use a high tech speech generating device as in you touch the, you know, the device speaks out for you. There's research around that too. But um, when and where would be more specific to the child? Uh, there are times that we just start with picture communication. There are times that we start with pecs and an exchange system so that we, you know, get initiation going. Uh, there are times when we start with a device. It kind of depends yeah. on the child and what they would be able to kind of um, uh, put together and how much they would be able to understand. And I know a lot of parents are scared of using the device because young children take it, throw it, yeah. you know, you might not be able to use it. So we do tell parents, okay, if you have that fear, or if the children child is you know constantly on the move and not really being being able to focus on that device and wants to just throw it or just wants to watch YouTube for example on it, we we'll say okay if you want to try another system we can, we can start okay. with a you know um, 
a low tech version but mm-hmm. we always have to think long run we don't yeah. think just for that one month or one week or one year we always think long run so you might need to change the system upgrade the system slowly system. as yeah. as the child develops True. Yeah, that's very true. I think it also depends a lot on, I mean, again, we, even though we're focusing on autism, a lot of children who come in with motor difficulties, we, we need to get all of those things also uh, into play. Right. Yeah, I think very true. So like you were saying, I definitely agree. There's so many myths around uh, using an AAC. And I think the first thing that all parents come with is, uh, this is going to hinder my child from, you know, speaking. So if I start using the AAC, my child is not going to talk. So can you just explain that and elaborate that to our parents? And, uh, it you know, it parents? is. I agree. It is one of the biggest concerns that I've heard uh, time and again that, no, I don't want to put my child on an alternative system because if I do that, then he's going to lose all his speech or he's never going to try it. Um, and, you know, my therapist has told me that if you go with this or the other parent has told me if you go with this, he's never going to speak, so on and so forth. So this is the biggest myth that AAC impedes or hinders um, child expressive language, a child's expressive language. And again, there's research. It's not me spouting it. There's research that supports this that says that that is not the case, that it does not hinder speech development in fact it improves natural speech development because you're simultaneously focusing on both the natural speech development as well as improving um, the language and communication capabilities of the child so it's not like only if you talk do i value anything you have to say or you feel or you think but here you go i've given you both speech as well as this And do you think you could do more with it? And research has shown that the speech developed more and better when they were given a multimodal way of communicating and not just speech. So AAC definitely does not stop. It does not reduce the motivation to use speech and language. Um, Yeah. That's, again, the biggest myth that goes around it. So they have used um, AAC, say, for verbal, there's a study done in 2014, that they were using um, AAC for minimally verbal school-aged children with autism, and they included um, the use of a speech-generating device, meaning a high-tech device that when you press, it says the word out, right? That's what a speech-generating device is. And what they found is that these children... The, the output, as in the verbal output, increased considerably. Okay. Uh, and they were able to use newer phrases and sentences compared to yeah. the group that did not have a speech generating device. Okay. So there is a study that says that there is a difference um, in, in the development of speech and language when you were giving a speech generating device, when you did not give them a a speech generating device, when you gave them a multimodal uh, form of communication and you did not give them a multimodal form of, there is a lot of difference in the two groups, right? So it also for the two, and this is again a big concern for parents, um, like AAC, if you start AAC, it reduces the challenging behaviors, the frequency of challenging behaviors. Why do those happen? Because a child is not able to communicate that they don't want to do something or they want something or or they want something specific, whatever it could be. This, you know, I want to play this, come and sit with me. I'm not feeling well. There's so many things that children want to communicate. And for children who have language and speech, speech issues, they're not able to communicate that. And that's really, really frustrating, which is, which is the same case for us. If we have speech and we suddenly cannot use that, we get angry, we get frustrated. Right? And what they have seen, again, the study is when AAC was given to them, different forms of AAC were given to them, it decreased the frequency of those challenging behaviors and the frustration around communication which increased communication to a large extent, which increased the child's, um, you know, just being calm and regulated around things, mm-hmm. which increased their need, their want to communicate mm-hmm. and using speech and speech didn't become this negative thing. Yeah, true, very true. 
And I think that's what happens to in a lot of places. It becomes because there's so much pressure put on our children that they just end up getting so frustrated, and we don't realize it. Uh, we just think they're throwing a tantrum, and we just stop at that. So I think that's very true. Uh, uh, coming into the part that I think this is the most important part of what we have come into a discussion is that uh, there are parents who definitely choose using ACs. There are a lot of people who do that, but many a times, even parents sometimes go all the way out, and when we give them advice, they go and buy the most expensive gadgets, and they come in, but. They don't know how to use it, or even the professionals don't really know how to use it for communication. Rather, it becomes something in terms of uh, picture identification. I just, you know, that's what it becomes, and then it just becomes a medium for that. It doesn't go into that place of using it for communication. So, what else could parents and professionals do, or how should they go about it? All right. So. Um... Why this happens is because again, of two myths that come in there, which is you, a child or an individual needs to have a cause and effect concept and show communicative intent to use the AAC. Yes. And the fact that uh, people seem to think that if the, if an individual has cognitive deficits, they will not be able to learn how to use AAC. Sure. Because of these two myths that float around, it becomes very difficult. Uh, for parents to go beyond that. So they assume that the child yeah. will not be able to do anything else unless they identify all the pictures. So yeah. if you don't know what a spoon is, how would you ask for a spoon? Or if you don't know what chips is, or you don't know what a chocolate is, you can't ask me for it, right? That's the understanding. Uh, but uh, to keep it very simple, how do children, and as really young children, understand that that shop or that mall or that restaurant is somewhere I like to go. It could be a McDonald's, it could be a Baskin Robbins, it could be any of these junk places. But how do they kind of associate that, oh, this is a good place. They don't know how to read as yet at youngest two, but they're not reading, but somehow they're connecting. What is that connection they're making? Some okay. representation they capture and the experience they have with it. They put the two together and they realize, ha, huh, this is a good place to go to. This is, uh, I'm going to the park now because this is the time I go to the park. So they start, you know, bringing in those memories and those experiences and making something out of it. And that's the same thing with AEC. AEC, the picture you use is just a representation. So if you're using it every time they get chocolate, they're going to understand, who this is chocolate, right? They, yeah. They're not going to have to be taught and that's unfortunately what's done because like you said, there are a lot of parents who tell me, yeah, I have an AC app. I do. I have this, 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 and, you know, I will have different names coming at me, but, oh, but I'm not using it because I don't yeah. know where to start. Oh, there are too many pictures in there. He's very confused. Um, and that's, you know, the general idea that comes around it. So it's really important to understand that identification of pictures is not communication and there's no way near communication, right? And you, you have to presume competence to know that a child will be able to pick up. If you go with the doubt, I don't know whether they can do it. Let me teach them everything first. You're going sure. to always stay in that. Let me teach first and then they will know it. And then they will know they're not going to figure it out on their own. And I think that's one of the biggest disservices that we do with our children that we just presume um, incompetence that they might not be able to understand. And that's, I think, where this stems from. Mm. Yeah. True. And again, a lot of research, again, that says that all of this, if you put it together, that there is development of language skills. There is, um, for those who have complex communication skills, AAC helps with functional communication, cognitive okay. development, right? It builds a foundation for literacy development. Yeah. It improves social communication. So there's so much that can come in. But we go into picture identification initially, right? And that has to change. Change. Yeah. Definitely. Very true. I think there's a lot of information that everybody, including professionals, need to understand that our children can do so much more. So I'm breaking that down a little bit. Uh, could you explain, okay, could you give it in a very practical way, how do we make it more effective? How do we use AAC to make it more effective and use it for communication? 
Okay, so I'm going to kind of break this down into different parts um, okay. to really understand because you have some goals as part of an AC, yeah. every AC program, which whatever AC program that you're trying to follow. We follow the Play Talk program because that's what we have developed, right? So I'm going to yeah. come from that perspective that any AC program, what is the goal that the child or the individual learns to communicate? That's writing, reducing frustration, mm -hmm. that they discover they have a voice. Okay, uh, it's yeah. to participate more in everyday life. It's to achieve a better sense of control over their life, to maximize their independence, right? To mm -hmm. improve their privacy and dignity, to mm -hmm. decrease caregiver burnout, because that's a that's something that gets missed out a lot. You well, need to yeah. have consideration for the caregivers too and that they don't burn out because there's so much of maybe challenging behaviors and they don't know how to deal with it and there's no communication right um and also for support for functioning in a variety of environments not just like let's do it during the speech therapy time let's do it during snack time and let's do it during yeah. um i don't know when we sit down together with mama or papa yeah it cannot be structured then you're saying okay you can only use your voice here and use your voice uh -huh. here and the rest of the time don't okay. right? yeah so if you're looking at making it effective you got to look at is your program going through this mm -hmm. is this part of your program if it is then you are already on one big stepping stone towards success another thing is to really look at the child's communication what does the child yeah. want to say Right. Uh, and that's one of the things we work on first. It's okay, let's sit down and just discuss what is your child trying to communicate with you? Mm -hmm. What are different things your child is trying to communicate with you? Um, it could be food, yes, because a lot of children are foodies. So it could be food, definitely, but I'm sure that's not the only one. Only thing, yeah. Um, it could be to go out, it could be to see friends, it could be to go down to the park, it could be to go for a ride mm -hmm. in a bike. When you start actually sitting down and thinking about all the things and all the situations, you mm. start getting a variety of words. Yes, yeah. initially they might be need-based, but if you do not go with that, then the child is not wanting to say, this is a plate, this is yellow, this is blue, this is green, this is a dress. Yeah. This is not. I'm not motivated to do that. Do that. Yeah. We are not, right? <laughs> As people who are using verbal speech, if I kind of you know when uh, come to you and discuss earth uh, like turbines with you and you're like yeah. huh? like i don't really not really interested in this i don't want to have this conversation our conversation won't continue okay right? okay i've considered yeah. this now how do i make it effective how do i put it into place right sure. and that's something i think uh, most speakers on in this summit as well as uh, mini tomorrow, we'll be speaking about co-regulation, attunement, mm -hmm. engagement, interaction. How do you yeah. make it if effective? You have to keep these four things in your mind. Now, because anything we do, right? If we are communicating, it's based on an interaction we are having. Mm -hmm. And the interaction will come only if you're both engaged in that conversation together. Conversation. Like yeah. you are engaged with me about asking questions. I'm engaged because I'm kind of like, oh, this question is interesting, so I want to answer it. So we are answer. engaged, yeah. right? But for that, we also need to be attuned to what the other person is doing or what they're feeling, and not just like you're not just asking me for the sake of asking me questions, right? Um, so there is a genuine interest to know and spread that knowledge some more to whoever's listening. So you are tuned to the other person, what they're saying, you take information from there, you're putting it into, you know, your own words and there is a back and forth. Now, if, for example, you had a stomach upset, you had a really bad headache, or you're just not able to focus on what's happening, you're feeling very like, ah, out of it. None of the others are going to come in. Come yeah right and um and that's where a lot of times our children are dysregulated so mm. we need to figure out is the child regulated is the child regulated with me co-regulated yeah. like the both of us are regulated together that they can take information from me is the parent yeah. attuned to what the child is doing and seeking 
or trying to communicate, do we have that back? Do we have something to be able to communicate that? Um, is there an engagement? Is there interaction? So for any kind of AAC program, I think the first thing parents need to think about is for regulation, agreement, okay. engagement, interaction. Everything comes from okay. that. Okay. All right. So, um, of course, we are, after that, building communication skills through waiting, waiting for the response. So important to wait because we tend to just hurry it up. No, he's not pressing. So let me show them what to do. I'll yeah. give a hand. Press, press, press. You know, if it's a, oh, exchange the picture, pick it up, show me, give me. Instructions start coming in. Now, what's the point of the instructions? Not communication anymore. Yeah. This has become a task. Right? So the minute it's a task, hmm, I don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like tasks. I know what tasks are. I know what work is. This is no fun. There I go, out the door. Right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, a couple of things like this. And to, again, like I mentioned, we'll consider all communicative functions. And to make it effective, you have to understand you are changing a whole language system. Mm. you are used to using verbal speech. Now, if you use verbal speech and you expect the child to talk back using AAC, there's a disruption there because you are using a different system. They are using a different system. You see. Yeah. So what do you need to do? You need to use the systems together. Yeah. Meaning you also need to use that AAC system. I'm not saying don't talk. Yeah. You use verbal and AAC because that's the model you're giving them. Hey, we could use that. both. True. Not like I'm going to keep quiet and I'm just going to like. Uh -huh. yeah. Then you're telling them, okay, this is enough. Yeah. But if you're like, oh, bubbles. And they press yeah. and they say, oh. so they hear the sound, they hear the speech, yeah. right? And they see that, okay, this gets the communication across. So that yeah. modeling is also really important. So if important. I want to. Yeah, summarize it, I would say, look at your goals. Look at yeah. what roadblocks are generally there. And if you want to make it really effective, you've got to look at and the interaction, before that, the engagement, before that, the attunement, before that, the co-regulation. Are they there? Yeah. Are you looking at a variety of communicative functions? Are you modeling the same system to them? Or are you just expecting them to pick up when you're using a different yeah. system? So it's like, I'm speaking Japanese, you're speaking Chinese. Hey, come, let's communicate now. Yeah. What's going to happen? We're going to start using gestures, pulling, and it's going to continue that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So these are things, again, to consider. It was a really long answer, I know. Uh, to consider trying to keep make an AAC program effective. Effective. Definitely a lot of information there. And I think it's very important uh, to understand that uh, in its in, in all of its levels so that we know how to make it work. Uh, Shari, just coming into, you kept mentioning about Play Talk. And I know that that's the program that you co-created here. Um, could you explain a little bit about it? And what was the genesis of Play Talk, of the Play Talk program and how it came into being? So this happened many years ago when we were exploring AAC for a lot of our children who are non-verbal. And we were trying to figure out, because we knew, yes, we need to give an alternative system, but what kind of system could we use? Um, the systems that we, we tried out were a little confusing. Um, so we were like, mm, what do we do about this? And also one of the biggest factors in creating this program was Children in schools were not given another modality and because of which uh, the teachers assumed or the school, everybody assumed that the child doesn't know something right? because he had no way of communicating his nonverbal. So frustration would build and they would be teaching them the same thing again and again. So I've had nine-year-olds who are still being taught ABC. Um, from like no. three years of age, they're still being taught ABC. Six years of ABCs. I think ABC has gone in by now. No. Right? But because they had no way to communicate that, that they knew, uh, and because of motor planning no. difficulties, a lot of our nonverbal children have motor planning difficulties. So they didn't have a modality no. to kind of really 
be able to say what they could. So it, it was actually, I would say the birth of it came from the experience of many children that we worked with who blew our minds because yeah. when we started working with them and we gave them an alternative system, they, we realized how much they know and how much yeah. they can actually communicate. I've had children, the same child who's nine, who was nine years old at that time, um, who was uh, being taught ABC. He was defining what mathematics was to me. He was defining what marriage is. He was commenting about me. Um, you know, like okay. auntie is like so and so and kind of a thing. You know, he, he was able to talk about why he finds it difficult to communicate. There's so much mm. of thought process there. Why is it we yeah. haven't seen it? Because we focused only on the speech, right? Mm. So we realized, yes, and we need something. It started there. <laughs> and okay. we kind of built on that where we could make it a holistic program. So initially when we created the program, uh, and the app, and the app is completely free for anybody to use uh, for an Android based system. It's called the Play Talk app. And it, uh, like I said, completely free. So it's what we wanted to kind of do initially, it was very similar to the, the picture exchange communication system program, the PEX program. Yeah. But we were looking at that was the foundation of it, I would say, because okay. you were certified in PEX. So we understood the competence of it. And so we're like, okay, let's see if we can make this high tech. Mm. So we started there, we started building a core around that. But then okay. as um, we brought in, we started bringing in more competence as Mini got certified and became an RDI consultant, we started bringing in more competence of it, uh, of RDI okay. into the program so that it was not just about that vocabulary, but mm. also about um, the education, the cognitive component, as okay. well as what we call the co-companion, meaning how can you use these words in a variety of contexts and adding context to it, right? It's not just about, I want chips. Oh, you're hungry. Would you like uh -huh. some chips? And to add on confidence there, not just talk about, I want chips, I want chips. Okay, done. Okay. Yeah. Right? So that's how we kind of created the program. And of course, like any program, it keeps evolving. And at, at this point of time, it has evolved into what it is right now now all right so coming into that i think let's i think our uh, next few questions is talking about how uh, things work in play talk also just because you've created it to explain that a little better uh is there you know is there like you were saying like what is the principle and the core you explained how it came into being but what is the core of play talk so keeping in mind all those things that i talked about of what an ac pro the goals of the ac pro yeah so we looked at not, initially it was, of course, communication, right? Language yeah. and building that. But we so, realized that's not enough. So we have cognition, uh, education. Mm -hmm. We have child's thinking and opinions about himself okay. or himself, as well as the world. So you're not just talking about creating a program around language and communication alone, but also adding a lot more components to it because then it's holistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whenever we learn, we don't learn like a single word and we stay there, right? We, we learn a lot of things around it. And that's exactly oh, what yeah. we wanted to do. We wanted to make it more holistic, right? So uh, we based this completely on natural language acquisition. How do children pick up on sounds and words? And how do they put words into phrases? How do they go from phrases to sentences? What are the kind of words they put in first? Is it the prepositions? Is it the verbs? Is it... Um, you know, adjectives, what comes where, and that's how uh, we, we kind of created this. This is the core behind it. Language, cognition, education, child's thinking, opinions, based okay. around this, right? Okay. And the principles, again, I will go back to the same four words, co-regulation, attunement, engagement, interaction. These, these I, I would say, are the four words that we will continue, I will be saying again and again, uh, because that's what it's all about. So we right. have three modules and five yeah. levels. Okay. Um, and we've kept the app in such a way that families can create their own content, whatever yeah. you want. You just have, a, what, what do you say, um, a platform. We've just created a platform. We've given you a few examples, but you are free to do what you want with it. 
and customize it to your child. Hmm. So that you're not limited even by the kind of context that's there and get like, oh, I can only say this or you know, the app doesn't allow me something else. Because language, communication, spontaneity, it's all very dynamic. Yeah. It's not static to, okay, I'm going to give you these words and we scripted it out and this is all you're going to be, be, be yeah. able to say. Right? So we have to go beyond. We have to look holistically. Otherwise, we're going to, again, get very scripted language. Language, yeah. yeah? So okay. these are the principles, those four words that I said. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the goals behind it, what we're looking for, and getting towards dynamicity in communication. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. It's, uh, you were mentioning, even when you were answering right now, that there are three, le three levels and you've got five levels that come in. Uh, so are we following a hierarchy when we use play talk? Is there a hierarchy that comes into place and how do we use that to build upon language? Right, there is definitely a hierarchy because you cannot introduce all the words at one go either. And okay. that's not what we do very na in, you know, in natural situations also. Yeah. Right? We don't expose or bombard the child with 10,000 words. Hmm. Um, we'd look at what are they looking at? What are they interested in? We'll build language around it. Then we introduce new things and we you know, build language around that, keep it fun and engaging all the time. So yes, there yeah. is a hierarchy where you're looking at level one so, so, like i said there are three modules and five levels so i'll just go yeah. through the five levels where you're looking yeah. at level one developing that interest intent and initiation for communication okay. three eyes as we call it so the interest towards it the intent and the initiation then we look at developing yeah. level two more spontaneous communication meaning mm. uh, and introducing say simple sentence structures so initially mm. it's going to be a single picture single word to combining pictures and combining words together because again that's what a two-year-old does they, they start putting words together and you know they get phrases in and so on and so forth right and level three continues to build on the vocabulary in terms of it could be adding more verbs into it could be adding more prepositions adjectives into the sentence and expanding on sentences commenting teaching the child okay. that everything is not an i want yeah and that becomes the reason we we put that in is because I want becomes such a generalized statement, a sentence structure that I had a child once come to me and say, I want itching. Um, He's trying to say it's itching. Can you help me with it? But he said, I want itching. Yeah. Because this I want has become this very generalized structure. And they think everything starts with I want. Yeah. Right? Sure. So it's so important to introduce different structures of sentences. It could be a give me, it could be a I see, I hear, mm. I like this, um, I am. Different mm. constructs to sentences. Yeah. And building that into narrative skills um, to maybe talk about a story and adding more language into that. Because again, books are such a beautiful resource of language and we, in, we introduce that to really young children, yeah. right? And slowly as they pick up speech, we expect them to imitate some of the words. Now, why can't we do the exact same thing where we're encouraging them to use the words if they're nonverbal through AAC? Yeah. Right? Like, oh, you're, we are reading a book together. Like, oh, it's hungry. Oh, waiting for them to also say hungry back. Yeah. And that's the engagement. Not like, show me hungry, where's hungry, who's hungry? No. Yeah. Right, not that, but in terms of through that engagement that you're able to build on more narrative skills. Because um, one of the most common things I have parents telling me is, he doesn't tell me what he did in school. He's not able to tell me what happened in the day. That's narrative skills. To be yeah. able to get there, you need to put a lot of language together. You need to get an idea of how yeah. I construct a sentence. So the advantage of AAC, it is very visual. So when we talk, right, we don't have words floating there for us to say, oh, you said this and then this and then that, right? But the advantage of using AAC is that it's very visual. So you see the structure of the sentence. You see, yeah. oh, I'm saying, mama, give me chocolate. That's how I'm not going, mama, chocolate, give me I. I'm not yeah. randomly putting words there. So when the parent models out, oh, mama, give me chocolate. Is that what you want to say? And they say, Oh, okay, that's how you start constructing sentences, right? Mm -hmm. 
So it's taking the, the natural way children actually pick up. And we're just yeah. changing the modality a little bit. But so, still giving so, them that natural way of uh, communicating with us, engaging with us without making it work and a task okay. to be completed. And I think the last one would be to go into more questioning, like where they start questioning us. They are so mm. used to us asking, what is this? Where is this? Who is this? Why is this? Da, 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 right? We should give them a chance to be able to ask those questions uh -huh. back. Yeah. Where is Papa going? Where are you going? Who is yeah. this? You know, why do I have to do this? And so on and so forth. So yeah. those are the different levels, I would say, mm -hmm. where your, your, um, the program goes through in a hierarchy. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, we look at three modules. Okay. It is, like I said, you have the core vocabulary, like it could mm. be food items, right? Okay. The same example, like you have the food items there. Um, it could be um, words around to build on the cognitive part of it. Um, and it could be also words to build around the context of it. So mm. you could have words like, oh, yummy, that was delicious. Right? You're not teaching the word, but you're modeling it out so that there's a context around the chips wow. or the chocolate or the whatever you ate, the idli that yeah. you ate, for example, that, oh, you had two of them, one more. And okay. so there are different things. So it's not just, I want to eat idli, finished, I'm done. Mm. I want to eat idli, yeah. idli, take idli, finished. Because we have one turn in an interaction and we're done. Conversation okay. is multiple turns. Okay. Right. And that's why we created these modules also so that it's not staying at just, I want this, you got it, now we're done. Yeah. Yeah. How could we comment about what you are doing? How could we add words in there? How could we expose vocabulary to the child mm -hmm. in a natural way? Putting those things also in place. Mm -hmm. So it's called core for us. It's called the core. It's called the core yeah. assist and it's called the core companion. I mean, yeah. Are the three modules that we put into every level okay so that it doesn't just stay at vocabulary either yeah yeah, yeah. very true yeah definitely oh that's a lot that's a lot to process and i think uh, even as a therapist i think for me there's a lot of information to know when we deal with children um it's beautiful and i think something that uh Shirin, that i wanted to bring into is that how does the play talk program? I, I know that we spoke about it right at the beginning, but there are children who come in with a lot of anxieties and you know there's a poor sense of competence and the children have about themselves. We think that they don't feel what you know we feel, but they do. And that, that itself leads to poor intrinsic motivation. So how does play talk account for that? Well, coming back to our favorite four words. <laughs> so again, it stems from why does a child have anxiety around a situation, right? Yeah. There has been some experience for them where they have probably failed at something. They yeah. realize they can't do something, right? Um, they know, they are very aware of the difficulties they have. They've heard people talk about them. Yeah. Of them. There's so much happening. Yeah. Now you're going to a new person or maybe the old person. So, but even everywhere, who are they going to judge me? Are yeah. they going to say something about me? So there's so much of anxiety around the child's life constantly. Mm. And still they do so brilliantly. And it's amazing yeah. how brave they are with what they do. They, because they know they have to, and still they try so hard. So I have to hand it to them, the amount of work they put in to really you know, get to where we are expecting them to be, right? how, how yeah. hard they work at it. So how does this, uh, how does play talk program help? Because it takes into account the same components in terms of, is the child regulated with me? Hmm. Does he feel a sense of competence? Does he okay. feel that he can do? Am hmm. I setting the stage up for failure or am I setting the stage okay. up for success? Yeah. Do I need to prompt them? Or do I give them some time to try on their own and then feel good about trying on their own? Sure. Yeah. Do we have, am I trying to teach them? No. Or is it working around what they're interested in? Am I attuned yeah. to that? Do I know what's happening here? Yeah. Are they engaging with me in any way? Are they playing with me? Are they having fun with me? You know, if they're not, willing to be with me there's no point bringing communication in because i'm not going to get communication yeah 
So what kind of play do they like? And children love play. Children don't want to read a book initially, right? They yeah. want to have play. Maybe it's physical play. Maybe it's toy play. Maybe it's sensory play. A different yeah. forms of play that are out there. And wherever your child yeah. is, are you t- attuned enough to know that that's where you could start? Yeah. Or do you have this goal in your mind that I'm doing sensory play? No, the child has to ask for the face shaving form now. No, no, no. He has to ask for the shaving form. Or he has to blow the bubble. Or he has to do this. If you have these 10 goals in your mind, you are not really going to be able to do so. Yeah. What happens? Anxiety increases again. Right? Yeah. So it's it's always coming back to how are you building that interaction? Mm. Right? And everything stems from like that being regulated, being attuned, being engaged with that other person. And you can achieve anything and not just like put an AC program there, but anything you can, uh, you want to yeah. achieve, you will achieve if you have these things in place. Yeah. True. I think, yeah, very beautifully put where we need to know that our children are capable of so much more than we can that, you know, they don't fit into our box, but they actually surprise us more beyond that. Uh, and that's something that our parents and, and professionals are like, people need to understand that we're not trying to fix them, but we're going beyond that. And that brings us actually to our very last question. And I think this is a question that uh, you would love to answer us and tell that, you know, what is the one advice you would love to give parents, especially who get so lost in, okay, Therapies are going, this is going on, you know, get so lost in doing the thing of, you know, and getting the method done. Uh, and how do parents become more aware and to understand their child, to integrate what we, you know, whatever we're teaching them into functional life and more, just making the child more independent on their own. Yeah, this again is, um, and I loved how some of the speakers also kind of uh, you know, talked about this. Um, And for those who haven't watched it, please do go back and watch some of these videos. They've got excellent advice coming in, um, in terms of like, why do we get lost in the doing? Because we're trying to fix something, right? We're always trying to fix something. So we think that if we do, 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 it'll get fixed, right? It'll get better. Yes, things do get better. But if you're always in, in the process of doing and you're looking at that end result, you are never looking at that process. And uh, the process is actually what builds the memories around that experience, mm. the language around that experience. It builds, yeah. reduces the anxiety around that experience. Yeah. Um, it reduces the behavior around that experience because the process, and if you are calm during that process and they had a pleasant experience, they will come back to it. But if they yeah. were just like, do this, pick it up, pick it up. Okay, next one, put the next one, put the next one, do this, touch this. Do-. And you have a, like a hundred instructions. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to be wanting to be there as, as a person. I wouldn't want to be there. I know I have my things in place and integrated as much as I think I do. But, you know, if someone is going to be telling me nonstop through the day, giving me instructions and just trying to teach me um, I would try to run away any chance I got. Mm. Um, and sometimes I find it overwhelming when I watch interactions um, between maybe the therapist and the child or the parent and the child. I get overwhelmed like, oh, it's too much information for me. Now, if it's too much information for me, what's the child going through? So yeah. slow down. Don't get lost in the doing. I know you want the result. But if you focus only on the result, you will miss mm. out on so much before that. And that's, um, I think, one of the things I like about the RDI framework is the, it's process-oriented. It's not product-oriented. It's not yeah. about, did you get to that? <laughs> did you, yeah. you know, say this word? Or did you, it was not that. It was, how did you get to that process of trying to figure out that you might need to say that word? Yeah. So, how much did we encourage the child to think for themselves and feel capable of thinking for themselves and feeling competent about thinking for themselves and, you know, getting somewhere. And then when they get that, you know, po- like a positive feedback to know that, Hey, I don't mind this. I, I did it. I did it. And yeah. we to do it again. So keeping that in mind, I always tell parents, um, because even when we do movement, this is something I see even when I do my movement programs, parents, 
I, I will teach a few movements and say, you know, next, just practice across the week, come back to me and let's see and send me videos how they're doing. And I'll see the videos like, put your hand up, put, 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 no, 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 down, down, no, put it this way, put it that way. And the child is like, like almost like a robot, just kind of doing it for the sake of doing yeah. it. Um, and everything gets lost there. If your child okay. is doing for the sake of doing it, he or she is never going to use that mm. every day. Because this, not so nice. I don't want to use it unless I'm forced to. Again, there, when I'm told to do it, I'll do it. But spontaneously, I don't. And that's yeah. why a lot of our children remain in need-based communication. Mm. Because everything else is instruction-based. Yeah. Right? So you have to kind of take a step back, slow down, get regulated with the, pa- with the child a lot more. Change yeah. yourself as a therapist and the parent. It's much easier to change yourself than change the child. And, yeah. you know, and kind of just break it down for them. Connect with them. Yeah. Even when we do movements, say, wow, even if they attempt, nice, I like that. Right? It doesn't have to be perfect that you put your hand all the way up. But did you attempt it? Whoa. So that process gets them to feel, ah, I could. And that's why we tell parents, don't get lost in the doing. Because the doing yeah. is so goal-oriented. Yeah. Be, as uh, Julie mentioned in her thing, you need to be, we are human beings, so be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, and I, I really love that, so I'm repeating <laughs> what she said. But it's really important to be, and we all forget it. I'm, again, it's not a blame game at all. We all forget it, yeah. right? Every day of our lives, we tend to go and like, then we realize, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And then we take a step back. And then we're actually able to do what we are trying to achieve better. So it's, yeah. it's not that I'm blaming parents at all into this. It, it becomes a natural thing for all of us. Like if I fix this, if I teach this, then he'll get better and he'll get better and then we'll get this and we'll get this. And, you know, we just go into that framework. So yeah. I think if they can expand beyond that, it will really benefit their children get them to think more independently that's that's so wonderfully put and that definitely brings us i know we just scratched the surface of this but that brings us to the end of today's conversation and uh shireen on behalf of the entire play street team we just want to thank you so much for taking your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us and for anyone who's listening to us who would love to know more please feel free to reach out. We would definitely want to explain this more. If you have any concerns and doubts, we would love to do that. And uh, thank you so much for doing this with us today. Uh, And to all our viewers out there, we hope that this conversation for the last one now has given you some insight. You know, uh, we know that we've just started it, but that our children are much more than what they, if they can speak or they cannot speak, but they have an avenue. If we can give them an avenue to communicate, we can they can do so much more. And that is our job to make it easier for them and to get them to become independent. So thank you all so much for tuning in and watching us. And we have uh, a special talk tomorrow where Winnie will be coming and bringing all that we've heard over the last uh, one month, bringing it all together. And you surely don't want to miss that. And we have a special video that's going to be coming out on the last day. uh, And that's definitely going to be something that you wouldn't want to miss. So please stay tuned and keep watching us. Thank you so much for joining. Take care and goodbye.